So with all of that as foundational, I think finally we can turn to looking at what actually has been happening with numbers of bears in this ecosystem. Again, noting that this is where agency managers tend to want to jump in, ignoring everything that I've covered so far. Before I get into the specific results for likely number of bears over time, uh, I need to start by flagging issues that arise from problems just simply with methods for how agency managers are estimating population growth rate in this ecosystem. Having to do, first of all, with the proportion of bears in the ecosystem that are actually contributing data that then in turn inform these estimates of growth rate. So here in this map, a hypothetical population in the yak and the cabinets. Data from bears that have been dropped into the cabinets uh, through the augmentation program are not included. Data from bears that are trapped for management reasons because of conflicts with humans are not included. And they are representative of a subpopulation of grizzlies that are uh, more prone than others to get into conflicts with humans. Males are not included. And as it turns out, um, of the females then that are left, roughly 90% of all the data that are used to estimate population growth rate come from females that have lived in the yak. So that leaves about 75% of the bears not contributing anything to the estimate of population growth rate. Um, you could consider them figurative or virtual ghost bears insofar as growth es rate estimates are concerned. But more than that, compounding this problem is the problem of the age of the data that are used to estimate growth rates. Notably, all of the data that have been collected since 1983 are used to update the estimates of population growth rate. Um, so this tan squiggly bar is proportional uh, at each point to the contribution of data from each of the corresponding years to the totality of data then that is used for estimating growth rate, population growth rate. But importantly, on average, those data are 14 years old. So I think there's good reason to argue that the population growth rate that is based on successively in incorporating um, ever older data is actually largely irrelevant to um, what's actually going on right now in real time. This is all tantamount to essentially managing the population in the rear view mirror with only about 25% uh, of all the bears of relevance in focus. So with all of that in mind then, we can tentatively uh, start looking at what has likely been happening to the size and trend of populations in the yak and in the cabinets. So here what I'm showing is something that's produced each year in the progress report uh, produced for the cabinet yak. Each one of these green dots <clears throat> is the estimate of population growth rate for that year based upon the data collected to date. So kind of a cumulative estimate of population growth rate, but tethered to 1983, including ever older data. Uh, the green band straddling these green dots represents the uncertainty of each one of those estimates for any given year. The point here being that um, the actual or true estimate of, or the true growth rate could be anywhere within that range. Notably then, um, there is not a single year where um, the possibility of no growth at all was not included in those bounds of uncertainty. 
So some would argue that we cannot ha conclude, could not have conclu concluded at any point in time uh, with confidence that the population had either been growing or declining. That's an important point. But again, as with so much else, leaving that aside for the moment, and also leaving aside for the moment the fact that all of these estimates of population growth are informed largely by females in the yak population that actively avoid conflicts using data that are increasingly aged. We do actually have a reliable estimate of how many bears we had in this ecosystem dating to 2012, thanks to work done by Kate Kendall. She estimated there were roughly 49 bears in both the yak and cabinet populations, anywhere between 62 and 44, accounting for uncertainty. Now, what's been done since then to estimate um, a number of bears any given year is to project out from that point estimate a number using whatever the population growth rate is for that given year using all of the data that have been collected since 1983. So the point being that it's a population growth rate tethered to 1983 and increasingly irrelevant to the conditions between 2012 and 2017. In fact, we do not know what indeed that growth rate was between 2012 and 2017, certainly not the growth rate that's being used because we're looking in the rearview mirror. So what likely has been the trajectory of the population specifically between 2012 2017, not from 1983 to 2017. We have some sense of that by looking at the rate of change in the rate of change, which is somewhat arcane, but nonetheless, nonetheless insightful, from 2012 to 2016, this period of time. And it turns out that the most likely population growth rate for that period of time was not 2.1% per year, which dates back to 1983, which is what you will hear advertised. More likely, it was near 0% per year, so essentially no increase in population size. Meaning that rather than 58 bears, more likely we have just about the same number we had in 2012 maybe something like 50, but with substantial uncertainty. And this range of uncertainty um, easily accommodating the 44 minimum that has been um, estimated in the most recent annual report. But again, keep in mind that this is based on data for po females in the yak subpopulation that actively avoid conflicts. So a pretty, um, unsubstantial basis for making any claims about population growth rate or numbers of bears in total in this population. So jumping tracks here a little bit, we can come up with an estimate of how many bears we might have had within certain bounds of uncertainty during any given year by projecting out from 1983 um, using that growth rate specific to any given year as we go forward in time, starting with some plausible number of bears in 1983. And these are the results you come up with. Uh, the dark green line is sort of a, a likely population estimate, but huge amount of uncertainty. And in fact, it's the nature of these sorts of exercises that with um, an exponential growth rate, the further out in time you go, the more the bounds of uncertainty explode. So that um, huge amount of uncertainty sort of masks what the dominant trend might be. So focusing on the dominant trend represented by calculations, we can do what's called a log transformation. So just simply to highlight trend to make it that more, much more evident, this is what we end up with. So focusing on that green squiggly line in the middle, 
first of all, noting that um, relative to the number of bears we likely had in 1998, we're not even back up to that number as of 2016, taking all of what I'm uh, showing here at face value with all the provisos that I've introduced. Nonetheless, even so, we are not back to where we were roughly 20 years ago. Also, uh, sort of as a corollary, it's very likely we had a substantial or significant population decline between 1998 and 2010. So this begs the question of what was happening? Which then brings us to uh, um, what factors might be driving variation in population growth. Now, making a key distinction here, we know why bears die. It's largely from human causes. But what factors might be governing the variation in the rate at which people kill bears, which could have to do a lot with the extent to which bears are exposed to humans, which in, in fact, I think is the case. Which brings us then to diet. And a dominant role of berries in the diet of grizzly bears in this ecosystem, as you all know, uh, grizzly bears here eat a lot of huckleberries, a lot of service berries, also some choke cherries, buffalo berries, mountain ash, Fortunately, um, Wayne Caseworm had the foresight to start monitoring the size of berry crops uh, for several different important berry species um, in 1989. So here, what we're seeing are trend lines for those crops for three different species. The gray dots, um, estimates, annual estimates for crop size, the squiggly lines, three-year running averages to highlight trend. So starting with huckleberry, we had a period of relatively large crops, then a sustained period of dearth, followed by recovery. <clears throat> For huckleberry, likewise, we started out with a series of relatively large crops, um, a decline from which we never recovered. For buffaloberry, a pattern much like what was, a, uh, what was evident for huckleberry. So you look at the periods of dearth, of rel relative scarceness of berry crops, and you can see that there was a marked coincidence of dearth for all three of these important species between 1998 and 2010, a period during which I would, uh, I think it's fairly um, fair to conclude that there was a berry famine. So focusing on huckleberries for the moment, um, undoubtedly the most important of the berry crops. Here again, their trend line. Here are the probable berry famine. In relation here to numbers of known and probable grizzly bear mortalities, again, a three-year running average to highlight trends, it's pretty clear, again, just by visual inspection, that there's a negative correlation between berry crops and numbers of bears dying. Now, importantly, uh, this relationship does not arise from bears starving to death. This period of decline associated with the berry famine has much more to do with the extent to which a dearth of berries configures where grizzly bears are on the landscape, especially vis-a-vis -vis people. And it's very likely the case that during years of small berry crops, grizzly bears spend more time near people where they're more, ex uh, more exposed to the hazards of people, um, which then brings us back to this lurking issue of human lethality. One final um, issue that needs to be highlighted before we leave the topic of uh, population size and trajectory, um, specifically the sensitivity of this population to even small increases in mortality. And to explore what that sensitivity might look like, I used uh, some software called a risk man. 
that allows me then to introduce, inter, entertain a scenario, for example, what would happen if one additional female were to die not every year, but every other year. Um, so I plug that scenario into the uh, model using all of the other population parameters as given. This is what I ended up with. A huge amount of uncertainty in the projections, but the modal projection importantly showed a population headed essentially to extinction. So the point being that these populations are acutely vulnerable to even even the most even the smallest increments of increased mortality for whatever reason. So provisional conclusions. The population probably declined between 98 and 2006. Population growth stalled more recently between 2012 and 2017. Uh, populations in this part of the world are vulnerable to variation in fruit crops, largely because fruit crops will determine where bears on the landscape relative to people. And moreover, these populations are acutely vulnerable to even, even very, very small increases in mortality, and especially human-caused mortality.